Hello, everyone. Warm welcome to this publication launch event, Sustaining Civil Society in Central Europe, Current Threats and Ways Forward of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. The attacks of illiberal governments on independent and critical civil society organizations are perhaps the most visible and most blatant examples of democratic demise in Central and Eastern Europe. The challenges posed by the shrinking spaces, the tightening of available financial resources, the intimidation of CSO representatives, and the nurturing of government-friendly uncivil society all have a significant constraining impact on the operation of CSOs in the region. But what strategies can civil society organizations push you to respond to the increasingly hostile political environment? How can partners and donors facilitate the necessary transformation and resilience of civic structures? And ultimately, what new approaches can lead to more sustainable models of civil society in Central Europe? In her recently published policy paper, which is the subject of our today's discussion and what you can access via the URL I am sharing with you shortly, Natalia Novakova provides well-founded answers to these questions. Natalia is a recent CE fellow at the German Marshall Fund, and she has more than a decade of experience working as a project manager and advocacy specialist in international development, human rights, and humanitarian initiatives. She has worked, among others, in Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and with organizations like the Norwegian Refugee Council or the Minority Rights Group. Natalia holds a Master of Public Administration degree from the Central European University and a PhD in Political Science from the Taras Shevchenko Kiev National University. Natalia, thank you for being with us today. And we have also two further highly acknowledged experts of civil society in the region who will discuss Natalia's recommendations and findings. Marta Pordovi is co-chair of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee and currently she's on sabbatical leave and conducts research at the European University Institute in Florence. In the past years, Marta has been literally in the front line and has led the operations of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee in times of the infamous Hungarian anti-NGO law or the Stop Soros legislation. It's probably, probably not an exaggeration to say that hardly anyone in Central and Eastern Europe has gathered more first-hand experience with the implications of shrinking spaces on NGO operations than Marta has. She was chosen to be part of Politico's 28 class in 2019. She's recipient of several prestigious human rights awards and was selected as Civil Rights Defender of the Year in 2019. Marta, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm also glad to welcome Pavel Havlicek, GMF's other in-house expert on civil society relations in Central and Eastern Europe. Pavel is also a recent CEE fellow and an analyst at the Association for International Affairs at AMU in Prague. Pavel earned a master's degree in Russian, Central and Eastern European studies from the University of Glasgow and the Jagiellonian University in Kraków. At AMU, Pavel is in charge of several research projects focusing on the Eastern Partnership countries and on democratization and civil society support. And he just recently published a GMF policy paper on the lessons learned from the EU's external democracy assistance. Pavel, great to have you on board as well. My name is Daniel Hegedusch and I serve as Fellow for Central Europe at GMF. As I mentioned several times, Natalia and Pavel works is part of GMF's Resync CEE Fellowship Program. The initiative was established in 2018 in order to support the next generation of policy analysts and civic activists from Central and Eastern Europe and the Western Balkan. The main goal of the one year long fellowship is to conduct innovative policy research, often with focus on niche topics that may deliver fresh intellectual and policy impulses to the democracy, security and prosperity related challenges which are faced throughout the Central and Eastern European region. Concerning the housekeeping rules of our today event, the initial contributions of our panelists will be limited to the first half of the webinar with the individual statements not exceeding 15 minutes. In the second half, we will have approximately 45 minutes for questions, answers, and discussion. Thus, I would like to encourage you to send me your questions via the Q&A function of Zoom that I can forward them to our panelists. I also would like to remind you that the event is recorded and will be available online at the YouTube channel of the German Marshall Fund. I am stopping here now and, uh, and over to you, Natalia. 
what are your main takeaways and recommendations in your paper? What are the main threats CSOs are facing recently in Central and Eastern Europe? And how can their resilience and sustainability be enhanced? You have the floor. Thank you, Daniel. It's a pleasure to, to be a part of this project and event and uh, to speak today about the findings and the research in general. So in the, in the research, I uh, focused mainly on the Central Europe, meaning Visegrad countries, as well as Romania and Bulgaria. And um, I guess it, uh, considering the, the discussions during the previous years, it doesn't make sense to really stop in detail on the um, political situation, which we call shrinking space. I think it has been discussed quite vividly and we all understand what challenges a civil society faced in the last, let's say, five years. However, I would like to point that uh, it was not the only external threat experienced by the civil society. I guess it makes sense to look at the process in the continuum and uh, see the transformation which happened in the sphere starting from the uh, extension, of, extension of the European Union to the, to the Central European countries because it has changed the environment for the civil society quite greatly, uh, in particular during the last uh, the last uh, decade after the after the expansion of the European Union the civil society found itself in the a little bit paradoxical situation when uh, their home countries were considered already developed and uh, being able to take responsibility for the civil sector and its support. However, in practice, it hasn't happened. And while international assistance and donors largely phased out their programs, unfortunately, the national governments didn't step in. Or as we can see in particular cases of, uh, for example, Poland and Hungary, the government did step in, but the um, proposed um, schemes of support of the civil society didn't appear to be uh, neutral and providing the equal assistance to all spectrum of the NGOs, irrespective to their position towards the governments. Um, but, um, and then, of course, in the, in the recent years, the civil society faced harassment, defamation campaigns, searches in the offices, um, attempts of registration, etc., etc. Uh, it seems that at the beginning, uh, what happened um, was a little bit of a shock for, for the civil society and NGOs, and um, um, nobody knew how to really respond to it because um, because nobody expected that the environment can become so controversial in the in the countries which were considered to be uh, democratic. However, during the last years, and uh, I would like to mainly focus on this, uh, we see the more and more trends on how civil society is regrouping itself and finding the new uh, tools of survival, new models of the operations, which sometimes are even more sustainable than what they have been doing and how they were operating before the crisis. Um, so looking at the, at the all the multitude of the of the models of operation of the civil society, I would like to start uh, stop on the three kind of strategies or tools uh, which they have been applying recently. And um, among those uh, trends, uh, the main three uh, are standing out. Uh, it is um, <clears throat> Uh, it is a new communication strategies and uh, new, uh, new tools uh, how to engage with uh, the constituencies, um, including both volunteers, uh, volunteers engagement as well as the trends in, um, uh, in the new crowdfunding or like building the relationship with, uh, with the community when the NGO is much more engaged in it, uh, including the financial part of, of the operations. And the, um, another one is the development of the solidarity networks. I will start from the new uh, trends in the in the communication. So it feels that uh, when the attack started on the NGOs, one of the main uh, weaknesses uh, which was uh, became evident was that 
uh, NGOs have been functioning in their own bubble, uh, being just focused on delivering some messages to the governments, for example, some policy advice. They have never really reached out to the society at large. And that's why it was quite easy to attack them because they haven't been quite widely known to the society. And, um, and understanding this weakness, many of the civil society started to adjust uh, their operations. In some cases, they were just lucky because before the crisis, they um, managed to attract more, um, more skilled communication uh, specialists or have been able to, to adjust their strategies. But in general, it seems that in those cases where NGOs were able to create really professional communications team and apply uh, better strategies of reaching out to media or people through social media, not just limiting to their own uh, bubble or not limiting themselves to, uh, let's say, um, not focusing on communications, then their, uh, their results they were able to achieve became uh, much better. It's true not just for individual organizations, but also to the social protests, because we see that, for example, in, uh, in Poland, when uh, the and big protests against the abortion laws were coming up, the, uh, the, they approach the issue of marketing and uh, branding of the protest really professionally and outsourced it to um, to the to to the marketing specialists which uh, made the, made all the symbolic side of the event much more catchy and easier to attract the attention of of wider groups of the population it's also uh, becomes much more widespread that the civil society organizations are engaging with uh, for example, celebrities trying to expand their outreach to the new uh, groups of, of people. That can be and can help both in the, uh, in the just creating public image, but also for fundraising activities. Um, another issue is, um, which is new in this sphere, is uh, bigger engagement with constituents. Actually, like uh, new communication is one of the tools in this kind of uh, direction or this task. Um, and um, <clears throat> and here I must say that there is a lot which still needs to be done because if we look at the um, at the data of the researchers on the, uh, for example, Visegrad four countries, we see that if um, uh, quite broad um, groups of populations, like around 70% of people, for example, are interested in the social issues, then the only 20% of this big chunk of population will be engaged with NGOs. So there is this huge discrepancy between population, which is which might be theoretically interested in the in the work. NGO is doing and those who are really engaging it, with, with it. So there is a, there is a really broad um, way to go still, but it seems that some people are already going this way. And um, it is very visible in the in the recent trends of, of the crowdfunding, for example. So if we take recent protest movements, for example, like in Czech Republic, the uh, million movements for democracy, uh, they really, at the very beginning of, of their activity, they realized that uh, one of the key weaknesses in their strategy is that the defamation campaigns uh, saying that they are funded by like external actors or some uh, malicious oligarchs from abroad, etc. So what they did is they established the transparent account, which made it totally visible uh, who is donating to this movement and opened it just for uh, Czech citizens. And uh, this strategy actually worked out because it's very visible who support them. The support is really national. And uh, the engagement with people is, uh, is developing because it was just the first step for the movement to organize protests. But in a year after their, their activity, we see that their network expanded to all um, major cities of the Czech Republic that besides the protests, they started doing other civic activities and they can base their, their work and their progress on that network of supporters, which was initially created just through donations. Um, <clears throat> another factor which is kind of um, um, growing from, from this trend is, uh, 
increased need of uh, transparency in those communications because of course if you are basing your activity on your supporters and ask them to support you not just morally but also financially then it means that you have to really report and be sure that that all that resources are used wisely and we see that also in the many websites of of the new organizations who are communicating very openly with their stakeholders reporting to them and creating this kind of lasting relationship where where they are basically um, doing the services for for their community um, of course such activity is not so easy to develop for all kinds of NGOs and traditionally there is quite a lot of skepsis about if it's possible to to educate the community and engage them in like difficult topics for example related to human rights which might not be uh, supported by by the wider communities um, and it is true however it seems that there are certain developments uh, on this uh, end as well and uh, for example uh, we see that such NGOs as anti-corruption initiatives, like for example, Watchdog Poland, um, which many people would think that it's also hard to engage on anti-corruption topics, but recently they are able to fundraise much more than they collect through support from, from institutional donors. Um, also, like in uh, the NGOs are coming up with uh, even more uh, creative ideas about that, like for example, in Bulgaria, the Single Step Foundation NGO, which is working on uh, LGBTQI rights and is um, working in quite difficult environments, both in terms of uh, the shortage of funding, but also attacks from, from the government on, uh, on the minorities' rights. Uh, so they started the co-working project, which is just a business which earns some revenues and which go just to foundation and um, and in this way they provide for their own activity. So it's very interesting to see how how the NGOs are coming up with a multitude of, of uh, responses and it seems that many of them in the long term will be much more sustainable than uh, traditional donor funding because um, in the uh, <clears throat> Uh, um, accumulating uh, resources through the uh, through the engagement with people with their community means that NGOs are engaging in the lasting and meaningful relationship and in case of attacks or defamation campaigns they will be much more protected than before because they are better known thanks to their communications thanks to their engagement with the larger groups of populations etc etc um, so that uh, gives uh, gives some sort of hope, and um, I know that my time is running up. But uh, uh, just to touch base on uh, on another issue, I wanted to say that another thing which is new in the region is um, solidarity networks, which also are quite instrumental in terms of uh, providing NGOs with additional resources. It sometimes seems a little bit odd that we are talking about solidarity because at least in the human rights movement it seems that solidarity is such a common thing. Uh, however, <laughs> however, um, recent, in the recent years, it feels that uh, there is less and less cases when NGOs really communicate with each other within or outside of the region in the meaningful way. And what we saw um, during the crisis, especially like I think that the first uh, very big example was Hungary when um, after the attacks on the on the NGOs, they came up with uh, creating the coalition civilization. <laughs> I'm sorry for for pronunciation, uh, but um, yes, which which united the NGOs both from Budapest but also from the uh, from the regions and even from the rural areas. Uh, which became quite a new step because in a way when you have a shortage of the resources of course coalition and joint activity helps you to maximize and to coordinate and to use resources wise, wisely but also the structures allow the exchange of information and uh, uh, just even um, support to the members which are in the smaller communities which are not so much uh, 
engaged in the process in the capital and might feel um, kind of um, being left alone with their problems. Um, so we see that uh, such coalitions appeared in Hungary, but also in other countries. We have the coalitions in Bulgaria. There are like, of course, like in Czech Republic, there are just multiple coalitions on, on, many, other, on many specific advocacy issues. But that seems to be also one of the responses which might help the civil society organizations to to kind of uh, create joint strategies and joint responses when they find themselves in the not so welcoming environments. And uh, I guess this kind of response will need to be expanded beyond the region because it's, um, it's very kind of, um, it's, it's something which is perhaps needed on, on the European Union scale, if, uh, if not beyond. Um, coming, um, coming to the recommendations uh, on uh, what needs to be done in this situation, I think that we are basically evidencing the like a natural evolution process and the thinking inside of the sector, which is transforming itself, not waiting really for uh, for any external um, assistance. However, uh, this transformation is fascinating and it can be facilitated in many ways because it doesn't go smoothly. For, for many reasons, uh, because if you expect the organization to innovate, uh, it's really hard to do uh, when it is experiencing really strong shortage of the resources, for example. And many in the sector find themselves exactly in this condition when they have uh, problems with the staffing, when they have the problems with, with retaining staff or paying even some sort of salary. So when, when many organizations are very in, in the very tough, uh, tough conditions, it would be great and it's, it's possible to support their transition uh, by first creating the conditions for it. But um, uh, yes, and also, of course, and so that, that can be done in the multiple ways. For example, um, when we look at the uh, successful cases of the organization which started apply, applying new uh, communications models, like if, if I can make it new marketing, basically, because they do uh, market themselves in this uh, new environments, they usually had some sort of resources before, which they could use uh, to invest in their innovations, invest in new stuff, invest, invest in this kind of new transitional period. So that's, uh, that's an obvious thing which um, donors can do and support identify, identifying those organizations which have capacity for such transition or interest and supported it by either flexible funding or uh, capacity development or perhaps a combination of the two. Uh, but it is ob also obvious that apart from this kind of technical support, there is a lot which needs to be done on the enforcing the uh, rule of law in the region because um, obviously the things which we keep observing are not acceptable in the European member uh, states. And uh, there is much more which needs to be done in terms of enforcing the rule of law, but I'm afraid that's not the topic of our current discussion. So I will wrap up here to give the floor to my colleagues. Thank you so much, Natalia. Uh, Marta, from the perspective of a civil society leader, what are the biggest challenges that may pop up from the adaptation process, which, which were recommended by, by Natalia. And, and how are these unfavorable political circumstances or the environment itself perceived among key civil society representatives in the region? You have the floor. Thank you, Danny. And uh, thank you very much, Natalia, for, for presenting your paper. I want to congratulate you on it. I read it with a lot of interest and many of the issues that you discuss are, are the ones that are the key topics, I think, for, and challenges for civil society organizations and even non-formal organizations, not only in, in the Visegrad 4 region, but everywhere. So basically in the past uh, few years, wherever I go, and meet colleagues working in, um, in, the, in the human rights arena, they are facing exactly the same challenges. And I think it is quite striking how this has become uh, a global challenge and many um, organizations are getting 
inspiring examples from each other. And I think this is one of the strongest points of the paper that it brings out a lot of very real, very detailed examples, many that have not been covered before. I think it's really great that, um, that you have you know, showcased all this rich experience from, from Central Europe because there is quite a lot of talk and, and worry about uh, the pressure on civil society, shrinking civic space, and we hear a lot about the attacks, but it's very rare that we would you know, have a, a platform to talk about the positive examples of, of, of resisting um, the shrinking civic space efforts and also the innovation that, that this and the longer process that you have described uh, after the 2004-2007 EU accession has triggered in terms of pushing organizations to revisit um, their, themselves and the way they work. But um, so, so I think this is really important to, to highlight how this is a global phenomenon and this is certainly playing out in Central Europe in a space where the countries that you mentioned are all members of the European Union and therefore this is a, a problem at the heart of Europe. Um, but there's also solutions that organizations are and, and coalitions of organizations are finding. Um, one um, root of this issue, I think, is, uh, is the general um, challenge of, of trust in public institutions. Um, the, the confidence that the public has in its own institutions is being eroded. Um, sometimes it's an organic process, sometimes it's very much facilitated or driven by governments. I would say in Hungary, it's the latter case. Um, and this erosion and undermining of public trust affects civil society organizations themselves. Um, as you also refer to, to it in your paper, there is quite a lot of, of still public trust in civil society across, uh, I think the, the paper cited a V4 study and has shown that um, civil society organizations in general, general still enjoy a higher level of trust than government, for example, or many public authorities. Um, this uh, is being undermined. The attacks on civic space are partly an attack on the credibility of civil society. And they come as a part of, of, an, of an effort to undermine and, um, trust and to create uncertainty. As if you feel on your own, helpless, um, then as a citizen, as a, as a person, as an individual, then I think there is more space for authoritarians to come in and say, I've identified your problem, I know what your threat is, and I will help you. If you think that you are not on your own, then this, this, um, this very often empty promise is uh, not so easy to sell. And so the attacks partly are motivated by, uh, by an endeavor to discredit. And so the question, as you also point out, is a question of credibility and gaining or, or, re, or holding on to the trust of, of the public. And there's various ways to do this. And you highlighted how communication um, uh, strategies are changing and organizations, if they have the resources and the assistance from others can overcome these challenges and become more responsive and, and more interesting and better at explaining what they're doing. But it's also a question of, of finding new ways to engage. And one um, uh, idea uh, that you also highlighted is about the solidarity aspect. So it's not only about who you're talking to and how you can explain what you're doing, even if it is sometimes an unpopular issue. Many human rights issues are not popular and human rights organizations will not strive to, you know, to gain that sort of public popularity um, that uh, political parties or or I don't know, other products on the market would, um, but certainly um, building um, societies of trust and also organizations of solidarity are important tools. And I think the Hungarian example um, of Civilizatio, the Hungarian National Coalition, uh, came out of, of the fact that there was a very consistent and aggressive 
attacks on civil society organizations who would do advocacy um, and criticize government policies, government policies that erode democratic checks and balances and human rights standards. And so um, this meant that organizations had to realize that they have to stick together. But, the, but even as the, the attacks themselves on a day-to-day -day basis have changed, shifted, or even subsided a bit, depending on the month, the, the mood, and the, and the wind, um, the coalition has managed to, to stay alive and is growing, uh, both in number and, in, and is growing in depth. And I think one of the reasons for that is that it also has other features. It doesn't only respond to, to the civic space pressures, but there is inherently organic activities. And one of these is exactly the sharing of expertise and pooling of resources for advocacy that, that is extremely important. And in the same vein, um, regional uh, networks of solidarity that, that uh, step across national borders are, are also very important. For a long while, I think the Central European organizations were very uh, unaware of what each country's organizations were doing, what were the challenges, although these must have been extremely similar at the, even then. And I think it's the past couple of years that this has seen a welcome change. There is, uh, I find, a lot more information sharing and meeting and interest and, and, and um, ties being built up, both informal and also formalized. And this should also happen um, beyond the regional level in, a, in our common European space. One example that I'm working on right now is to create um, a network of human rights organizations and human rights organizations leaders in uh, many European Union member states which are facing shrinking civic space challenges. This project is just starting. It will last for two years and um, it's uh, called Recharging Advocacy for Rights in Europe and it's uh, just uh, about to, to um, start its actual activities by involving um, key human rights uh, defenders from, from um, a lot of member states. It's supported by the Mercator Stiftung and the Council of Europe, which is also great because these are donors which until now have not been very active in, in Central Europe on, on human rights issues. And it's great to see that I think with the deterioration of the political context, some donors are stepping up their, their activities and their support, and this is very needed. The goal, however, is basically to have civil society organizations realize that when uh, one is being attacked, this also translates into a threat of an attack against everybody else. And that in our shared space, particularly in the European Union, um, this also means that we must all call out the problem for what it is. And I think this is also a key aspect of sustainability, of basically knowing your identity um, and, and, know, and calling things out for what they are. And I think this is the value, one value of civil society advocates, that, um, that they have the, the mandate to do it from their mission, from the, from the human rights framework, but also the, the sort of moral responsibility. I think everybody in this sector is super committed. And, and that also is a huge source of, of strength. It's a resource. And so I would also add, in addition to the communication and the constituency building aspects, the strong um, suggestion of advocacy of, of not not accepting that space is shrinking because that would it mean accepting a restriction on our on our freedom on our fundamental rights which is unjustified and so we cannot let that um, these rights uh, to 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 evaporate before our very eyes and i think this is one aspect that has driven for example in hungary the civilizatio coalition to not only call it out not only in terms of addressing the public or decision makers, but also the legal challenges that we have done to, to um, show 
that within the Hungarian legal system and within the European legal system, these restrictions are not uh, justified. They, are not, they should not be allowed to stand. And these successes, I think, are very important. They also are coming um, into, into play when, it, when uh, Bulgarian organizations are now seeing um, uh, amendments or drafts, as I understand, that address foreign funding. Also, the discussion is happening in Poland. And so it's very important to show that certain things cannot um, uh, you know, fly in, in, in the European Union space. We have standards. We have to enforce them, particularly when it comes to our own space, we have to stand up for them. And I would offer this as a, as a further um, uh, factor in, in sustainability. Uh, as, as recommendations, I absolutely second what you write in your paper uh, that are addressed to donors, but also going beyond financial support. There's a lot that the international community um, can do. And this is basically to keep doors open and to open doors. So I think it's high time uh, more politicians than currently realize their individual and institutional responsibility, how civic space is so closely linked to, to protecting rule of law in Europe, as you said, and how um, the, the measures to restrict that space affect rule of law protection. So it not only restricts human rights organizations space, but it restricts the space and the security of citizens and, and businesses. And I think the link there has to be more pronounced and there should be um, more courage uh, on the part of many in the political arena to, to recognize this and to stand up for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Marta. Uh, Powell, based on your own research, where do you see connecting points and very distinct differences between the actual civil society situation in Central and Eastern Europe and the situation in the not so distant past in the Eastern partnership countries? Can civil society organizations in, in Central and Eastern Europe learn from the Eastern neighbors how to operate in an unfriendly political environment? Uh, what's your take on that? Thank, thank you so much, Denny. Um, so uh, I will be looking at the whole problem from a little bit a more international perspective because my own research is basically dealing and looking at what the EU is actually doing in the Eastern Partnership region and uh, how uh, basically the EU is interacting with civil society, promoting democratization and also stepping up for uh, civil society uh, in the region. And so I'm trying to uh, later on bring some of the good lessons learned back uh, to the EU itself, you know, because this is, this is the paradox that Marta described, you know, that <clears throat> basically we are not doing the job uh, at home and we are uh, in fact doing that more outside you know and this is the clear experience from uh, the eastern partnership you know that we have seen uh, we have uh, not only more tools and funding for civil society as as the eu uh, to support them but also we are having um, much more radical and much more vocal positions on uh, what are uh, what are the right and wrong, wrong positions you know uh, when it comes to the for example illiberal policies that you uh, daniel started uh, the discussion with you know we are uh, refusing them abroad you know when it comes to uh, oligarchization of countries uh, such as uh, ukraine moldova or georgia but we are not doing entirely the job uh, at home unfortunately so so i was looking exactly at these uh, at these uh, components and uh, especially at the eu level of things and i will be uh, basically uh, suggesting some of the uh, concrete uh, policies and and recommendations um, what can be done also at home but first uh, to to go back to your question daniel uh, so uh, it is it is exactly what uh, what marty actually has has said because uh, Many of the features that we, uh, the civil society, is experiencing in uh, the eastern neighborhood, you know, are exactly the same uh, as uh, in the European Union, with a simple and but very important uh, um, differentiation. And this is that we have the framework. You know, we have the straight jacket of norms and values that. Uh, that all the member states subscribe to. I know that you, Daniel, in particular, but also other colleagues are very, very critical towards how the member states are actually eroding that, you know, and how much they are overcrossing the red lines. And this is all true. But 
uh, we have the biggest advantage in having the framework in place for the Eastern partners. You know, this is not the case and the local leaders can just go in all possible directions. You know, obviously there can be, and there is always uh, the European criticism of uh, this going in all directions in civil society, in, uh, you know, the, the state of democracy and so on and so forth. But it is much more difficult, you know, to challenge this, you know, rather than at home where we have the legal tools, where we have this and that uh, in place. So, so this is the, the biggest, um, I would say, uh, starting pro point uh, in, in differentiation between the two situations of civil societies, but also obviously uh, also some of the commonalities where, which are actually stemming from all of these countries being post-communist, you know, having the, uh, as some of the Czech representatives described that to me in my own research on the Czech uh, civil society, uh, having this gap of 40 years of communism, you know, between uh, the interwar period uh, that at least in Czechoslovakia was rather positive and uh, then obviously the post-communist uh, uh, um, uh, times, uh, which obviously what, what Marty has hinted on uh, affected the public trust towards civil society, which obviously uh, affected uh, how we perceive a civil society, uh, how uh, how deep this is actually rooted in the, in the in the civil society and all of these public perception and the post-communist heritages and legacies are actually shared uh, among all of our countries uh, starting from Ukraine and ending up with, with, with Czechia and others in the region. So, so these are some of the similarities and, and differences and now I will move a little bit to the EU level that I already uh, spoke briefly about and the fact that uh, EU is in fact uh, doing much more in some respects uh, in uh, outside in the eastern uh, neighborhood and also in the southern neighborhood than it is uh, doing at, uh, abroad, uh, at home, pardon me. So one of the concrete examples uh, which I try to elaborate on in my own research is uh, the, the, the creation and operation of the European Endowment for Democracy, which is um, basically informal body that was uh, founded by the EU member states and EU institutions. It is a common project that is actually operating uh, throughout the uh, neighborhood of the European Union. And it is uh, very, very flexible and it is very um, well equipped, uh, so to say, uh, in supporting civil society uh, in exactly what was described, you know, uh, core funding, stru structural structural uh, funding for uh, communication, for advocacy, you know, for um, for things of the daily needs, you know, of the civil society. These are all things that uh, the European Endowment for Democracy is supporting and can be supporting on on uh, on as part of its mandate, you know. Also, also, and what is also a bit different, and this is going back to Natalia's point about this. Um, political pressure and attacks and obviously also uh, the kind of um, politicization of the whole of civil society. Uh, the, the endowment can be also involving in uh, different, it is much more flexible when it comes to the type of actors that uh, it can be supporting, starting from grassroots and providing really small grants of several thousand euros to really big uh, funding of more than 100,000 uh, euros, you know, that can be just a uh, uh, flew to civil society in the needs, you know, and this can be both emergency funding uh, and the fastest grant, as I understood from uh, the director of the you know, foundation, Jerzy Pominowski, was distributed within 24 hours, you know, 24 hours. So, so one day for uh, basically signing the contract and sending the money to our organization. This is something completely unprecedented, you know, in the European Union, and we are simply missing that altogether. So, so obviously, obviously, all of these flexible tools, you know, uh, uh, um, decrease administration of, of granting and so on, we are also, we are also needing in the EU itself. And that's why I also called for creation of something similar to the European Endowment for Democracy in the EU itself. Um, now I will proceed a little bit further uh, and to go and have a look at the current picture, what we are actually having in the pipeline, because actually um, some of the things, starting from the current negotiations on the MFF and uh, the conditionality on um, uh, some of the EU funding, but also other uh, types of uh, EU legislations are actually opening the doors that, uh, that Mart Martin mentioned, you know, uh, that is appreciated from the civil society uh, to, towards the uh, international partners and stakeholders. The, these uh, parts and bits of legislation are actually uh, opening the doors uh, as, as was suggested. And these, uh, here I talk especially about the European uh, Union Democracy Action Plan. This is specifically dealing with uh, the uh, support to civil society, including providing funding, including providing flexible funding, 
including providing also core funding that was called for uh, in uh, Natalia's paper as well. Uh, unfortunately, and this is, this is where uh, the civil society across the region, but also in the old member states are, uh, is missing the opportunity is that there was a public consultation, you know, in which, uh, for example, my organization, AMO, was very actively working on, you know. Uh, so there was the public consultation, which was closed at the beginning of uh, September. And you can imagine out of uh, almost 500 million, it used to be in the EU, um, uh, 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 people and uh, so many uh, uh, thousands and dozens of thousands of organizations, they only received 300 uh, inputs into the public consultation, you know, uh, which, which, which is really, really a low number, you know. All of the uh, civil society actors, including, uh, including obviously every single of the EU citizens could be contributing to those, you know, but uh, it, for whichever reason, uh, just did not happen. And only three, 300 uh, contribut uh, contributions uh, were received by the European Commission into this crucial piece, piece of legislation. That is, as I mentioned, to deal with uh, uh, civil society support and the shrinking space and uh, the EU's response to that, uh, but also the issue of disinformation, support to independent journalism that Natalia also uh, spoke about and wrote about in her paper and so on and so forth. Uh, there are also other opportunities, you know, which we should be making use of, you know, uh, which are obviously to do also with rule of law, um, issues, uh, media, uh, uh, independent media action plan, you know, these are all pieces of legislation that the European Union is actually pushing ahead, you know, and we should be uh, seeing at, uh, opportunities uh, from the civil society point of view across the region and across the whole of the Union. So, so this, is, this is about the EU uh, itself and the international component here. Uh, I will be now uh, jumping and picking up uh, on, on individual points that were also mentioned, but uh, obviously we will touch up on so many of those in our discussion. <clears throat> I just wanted to quickly respond to uh, this issue of uh, the attacks and uh, obviously the politicization of the civil society space. This is uh, once again something that uh, basically the EU and non-EU countries have a little bit of uh, not in common, but rather like split and different because uh, in the uh, EAP countries, countries, it is quite common that the civil society is still very much present in the political landscape of the countries. It is shaping the political agenda. We, can, we could see that very vividly, for example, in Ukraine after the revolution of dignity uh, in 2014, uh, when uh, the reanimation package of reform was on a weekly basis, you know, setting the agenda for political parties to work on, you know. We are not having that, unfortunately, uh, in, the, in the EU uh, anymore, you know. This was something that Natalia spoke about after the 2000 2004, you know, when not only uh, the international and European and Western donors, you know, and foundations basically somehow withdrew from uh, the region somehow, uh, perceiving that as a stabilized and mission accomplished, but so this is, this, is, this is also something to do with, uh, uh, obviously, um, um, contestation of uh, the political arena uh, within our, our own countries. And uh, we can be looking for roots of that, you know, obviously the 2008, 2009 uh, uh, economic crisis and uh, growing uh, uh, antagonistic sentiments towards the EU, but also civil society and liberalism in general uh, were uh, the one. But in Czechia, for example, here I will go back to my home country, the 2015 migration crisis was uh, a moment when uh, the, the support for uh, civil society really uh, dropped uh, rapidly, you know. So, so, so these are, these are uh, elements and milestones uh, in which uh, we should be uh, perceiving as very important ones uh, when it comes to uh, basically pushing the civil society outside of the political uh, scope and the, the political life of uh, the countries, you know, into this uh, service providing role and uh, basically caring about uh, uh, the, the functionalities of the state that are uh, not working basically and supplementing the state in uh, some of the areas. And, and this is a problem, you know, and we need to be reversing this trend. We can be looking for different ways to do that, you know, obviously, and this is something what I also called for in my own paper to step up the public diplomacy also from the side of the European Union. Uh, in, again, one, one, one more uh, differentiation between uh, the EAP countries and the EU itself. You know, if you have a look at the EU mission uh, to uh, individual EAP countries, for example, and I was looking at uh, Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine, you can see that these uh, and the heads of um, 
of uh, these delegations. These are really uh, well received, you know, public individuals who are really uh, important political players. It is not the case uh, in, in the EU member states and the EU missions to, uh, and delegations of the European Parliament, of the European uh, Commission, you know, they are basically silent, you know, or very timid, you know, when it comes to refusing this, uh, the, uh, the pressure on, uh, on civil society, but also the kind of rise of illiberalism in our part of the world. So, so this, this needs to be reversed and obviously some of the uh, lessons learned from the East uh, can be taken on board uh, here as well. So, um, so this is this is on the this is on the basically um, so to say attacks and this uh, politicization uh, level. Uh, obviously, this has huge implications. What what Marty mentioned uh, about uh, the advocacy-driven uh, NGOs. This is this is a fundamental issue that uh, is actually uh, very very transparent and very vivid in all uh, uh, the uh, the uh, Central European countries. You know that the advocacy-driven NGOs are pushed. They are being you know, they are labeled as political NGOs, so-called. Um and, uh, and the most recent uh, research uh, from, from, uh, from Czechia just presented last week uh, identified this uh, labeling of political NGOs as a, a really weak spot uh, in, in uh, attack against the civil society, obviously uh, hindering the sustainability of the whole uh, sector. You know, uh, when, when you try to divide and rule basically the whole sector and identify some of the actors as, 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 as political, you know, uh, then, uh, then this this might be really fundamental for for uh, shifting shifting the public perception of civil society in general. So we we should be really really uh, careful about this and prevent that. Uh, how how to prevent that? Uh, Natalia mentioned about uh, the uh, inclusion of uh, the celebrities. Uh, here I also suggested uh, to include other uh, public actors, uh, public intellectuals, but also political parties. You know, uh, I will describe uh, one last situation and then I will pass uh, the word back to you, Danny. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when uh, the whole situation with our Prime Minister Andrei Babish and, and, and his conflict of interest started to be investigated, not started to happening, this was a while ago, but started to be really investigating. It was the civil society that drove uh, the whole efforts and actually submitted some of the reports, critical voices uh, also to Brussels and, uh, and Olaf, uh, but also the European Commission, you know, distributing some of the structural and cohesion funds that uh, his, co his companies were profiting from. It was, it was uh, the civil society, and in particular, uh, um, um, uh, the Transparency International and its uh, Czech head, uh, David Ondráčka, who was uh, at one point just standing against the Prime Minister, you know, from civil society against the Prime Minister. It is a very unfair, uh, unfair fight, you know, and it was really of cru crucial importance that the Czech Pirate Party actually got very importantly uh, involved and put the issue of his clash of interest back to where it belongs, which is the, uh, the political arena, and this is the Czech parliament, you know. It is not a fight between the government and the civil society, but this is a purely political dispute that civil society obviously has a word on and should be very critical in bringing this up, but then it belongs back to the parliament to discuss and, and, and fight for in political realm. So, so once again, quite concrete um, uh, suggestion what, what can be done to uh, reverse this, this negative tendencies and reverse this criticism. Uh, there are many more points, but uh, I will be happy to come back uh, later on. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Pavel. Ladies and gentlemen, the Q&A is open. Please send uh, us your questions via the Q&A function. That's the button uh, down below uh, at, at Zoom. And uh, probably uh, we could start with a couple of questions of, uh, of Katarina Pishikola. The first one is, uh, is addressed to you, Nati, whether you took into consideration in your research uh, the existence of informal civil groups and whether some of your diagnosis or some of your recommendations uh, would be a bit different uh, if, uh, if you also uh, uh, fit them into the picture. And the second question is, is addressed to you, to you all. Uh, several Central European countries which pursue anti-NGO policy, policies at domestic level are also engaged practically in a sort of democracy, uh, advocacy, democracy export at international level. I think one of the latest good examples for that is the role of Poland uh, in the Belarusian crisis. And the question is uh, whether it has any impact both at domestic and international level on the activities uh, of the CSOs that, uh, that 
they experience shrinking spaces at domestic level in, in these countries, and whether you know any concrete examples and CSO organizations which are caught uh, in a similar situation. Um, I think over to you, Nati, uh, probably. Thank you. Uh, well, I will start from, so, um, yeah, unfortunately, in the, in the research, I did focus on the established NGOs uh, just for, for the purpose, because it was a la like limited uh, scope and uh, we, we had to focus on something. But um, I do think that there is a fluidity currently, because if you look at them, and the initiatives, for example, I already mentioned this uh, million moments for democracy in Czech Republic. I mean, just in 2017, it were a group of three enthusiastic uh, lawyer students who suddenly, that, that was just their students, you know, activism kind of activity, which now grew into, and then like, then when they started from their manifest, when they started from the protests, now they are NGO which operates significant amount of money. I mean, that's uh, the last time I checked their budget, it was like several hundred thousand euros. And at that moment, like it's sort of like a question, if you become successful, will you have to transition into established NGO? Like the similar question we see now outside of EU when, um, when the civic when, when the crackdown on the protests in Belarus started, a group of uh, CSO activists from Belarus opened Facebook fundraiser uh, to to get money for support of uh, beaten protesters. It's like very hard to imagine, but in three days they accumulated two million euro. I mean. Do they have to establish themselves now to, to operate this money efficiently and transparency? Of course they do. So, I mean, that there, is a, there is some sort of fluctuation. However, I think that uh, indeed, thanks to, to modern media and communications and everything, uh, we see a lot of inspiration exactly from this uh, grassroots movements. And uh, of course, they are the ones uh, who usually pioneer uh, most of the flexible approaches and the things like that. But um, I would not really want to distinguish between kind of a professionalization and then uh, like just perhaps taken on on the one of the other questions in, in the chat. I think we really need to understand what we define as a professional NGO. And unfortunately, in the recent years, both in Central Europe and, and outside, when we talk about profession, professional NGO, we usually mean somebody with a good track record of, of, the, of the donor funding and, and the hired staff and, and things like that. But that might be not the most uh, necessary features for survival and uh, long term kind of sustainability of, of the whole sector, because I think also referring to, to the issues which um, uh, Pavel and, uh, and Marty raised about the advocacy. Uh, and, and political NGOs. Usually, yes, exactly those advocacy and political groups are, are professional in the, in the classic sense of this word. They, they hire professional experts, usually lawyers and, 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 and the like, and uh, uh, these people are really great experts in this sphere. However, they become very vulnerable in the modern environment when they can be uh, targeted by defamation campaigns, because exactly because they are, um, they are using used to talking about their work in very professional, limited, uh, like professional way, not really engaging with the society. And it seems that that, that has to be changed. So I think that um, if hopefully in the future, we will see more convergence between this kind of modern engagement, engaging communications. I hope that uh, we will see that the change into advocacy strategies because it seems that that the old professional patterns when you just litigate or when you just uh, have a debate in the parliament is uh, is coming to the past and what we need to see is more comprehensive campaigns addressing the issues engaging the people because in the long term run if you think about it because i guess we are also at that point when we realize that uh, democracies don't just uh, the, the fail as well uh, so if, if you have to if you need to have a sustainable civil society and sustainable democracy then it matters what people think and what 
kind of values they share. So that's also one of the very important uh, tasks of all those civil society groups, not just to advocate vis-a-vis -vis the politicians, but also, so to say, advocate vis-a-vis -vis the broader society groups uh, for those democratic values, educating them and explaining why particular reforms or particular values really are needed. Uh, but also coming to this uh, second part of the uh, of the question about um, uh, the role of Central European countries as donors, unfortunately, I feel that uh, it is partially a problem uh, because, in a way, uh, like many of uh, civil society organizations and, and people who are successful in their countries have turned a lot of energy abroad because, and uh, that. Uh, happened for many reasons, uh, organically, but also forced by, by donor funding. Like, for example, in uh, some of my interviews, I remember people in, in Poland saying that they have to try to embed a little bit of domestic activity in the funding which goes for activities abroad just to kind of trick the donor a little bit and and try to to have some resources for do things which they see as necessary in in their own countries because actually they they have much more resources for acting abroad and it's uh, it becomes uh, a little bit of a problem when uh, when the domestic situ situation uh, becomes a little bit le less stable. But we also see this uh, contradiction, contradiction on uh, many other levels. For example, Polish government can uh, agree talking to this NGOs as actors abroad, but will try to limit their operations domestically because <laughs> because they don't mind uh, the human rights promotions in Ukraine, but are not particularly welcoming this back at home, uh, which shouldn't be the case, but is unfortunately a part of our reality, which, which needs to be changed at this moment. But also another aspect which we haven't touched upon, there is also kind of um, this uh, question of uh, business philanthropy, for example. And that also has been raised uh, during the interviews that uh, many of domestic philanthropists in, in Poland or in Hungary um, are looking much more much more abroad into the problems of developing world and don't really realize that uh, their support is currently needed uh, domestically. I will stop here. Yeah, thank you, Natalia. Mar Marty, Pavel, would you like to jump in? Yes, there's a number of things, but on the professionalization issue, I'd like to come in. Um, so very often professionalization is equated with being technical experts who have no links to, to the reality, the, the, the real context, the, the constituencies' needs, their, um, the, the, that they are operating in a bubble, rather. But in, I would argue that there is far more uh, to, to that term. And one thing that I really think is necessary in every context, but particularly in a, in a difficult political context for human rights organizations that do advocacy. So there's this little asterisk may, may not apply across the board. But what I would say is that it's really important to be professionally working as an organization. And this means to have sound, prudent, fiscal, financial procedures. It's not only to, to satisfy donor expectations, but this is one important shield against uh, harassment by authorities and also um, you know, proper administration of funds and transparent operations are actually uh, good, good uh, tools to also counteract smear campaigns. But also when it comes to not very um, exciting topics maybe, as human resources, I think we need to be really, really aware of, of the toxic environment externally and internally that can also characterize human rights organizations. There are very sad examples from large global organizations out there. We have to learn from this and we have to make sure that the, the, the staff um, or volunteers or, or anyone who comes into the contact with the organization remains um healthy mentally too 
And this means that, uh, for example, we have been providing mental health support to any of our colleagues who, who want to benefit from it, those who work on asylum cases. This is very atypical for lawyers. It's typical and good practice and also mandatory, I think, in many of the helping professions, such as for social workers, but legal staff generally don't get any support. They can be um, subject to a lot of stress. And so we first rolled this out for colleagues who are advising asylum seekers who themselves also have to, you know, have to put up with a lot of stress and difficulty um, and, and for them to become better at handling and managing this stress and making sure that it wouldn't affect, um, you know, their, their mental well-being in their private lives. But also as pressure intensified, this is something that we're, we've started to offer to our, any of our colleagues. Um, and I think it's really important, but this is, this is just one um, almost extreme example of burnout prevention, but there's lots of others. So many human rights organizations, and I think this is maybe beyond human rights, also many civil society organizations are very overworked. There is a work ethic that requires people to make sacrifices and that's unhealthy. And that is, um, that is a sustainability issue eventually that should be addressed. So for me, a professional well-working organization encompasses one that takes care of its own staff and, and you know, uses resources in a professional way. We've seen how once there is money involved, um, problems can also come and it's better to be uh, getting ahead of that um, by, by installing good management, financial management board and governance practices. And this is something that is very often overlooked. And I think it's, it's, it's a good, um, good practice to invest in. Thank you, Martha. Pablo? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Denny. So just uh, quickly on the two uh, main questions and then some uh, quick follow-ups as well. So uh, when I was doing uh, the uh, 2018 State of Civil Society in Czechia research, you know, <clears throat> that we discussed also with Natalia earlier on, uh, we actually identified some, some of the gaps here. And one of the questions was between uh, the grassroots and the organized part of the civil society. First of all, it is much, much more challenging for a researcher to grasp the informal civil society. It's, it's much more challenging actually to, to get the access, to get the contact. I tried myself and uh, struggle with that actually uh, at the time. Um, but what was clearly identified by some of the people who were sort of like in between or in part of the formalized civil society, but uh, having uh, strong connections uh, to the grassroots one, uh, rather than informal uh, part of the civil society. What was identified was a big gap, you know, and uh, uh, this was also to do with uh, competition, uh, obviously for for resources, for uh, for attention from the policymakers in terms of. Um, also, also uh, basically advocacy uh, and so on and so forth. So, so there was a big competition, you know, and this is exactly what, what Marty was uh, uh, speaking about, actually. The, the kind of, uh, uh, the, the fundamental basis for civil society to operate, you know. I was also pointing to one uh, crucial element at that time, and this was uh, so, such a low and actual lowest in the EU um, uh, rates of unemployment. And this is a big challenge for the civil society to really attract, attract the, the best talents, you know, to offer the financial means, you know, to employ these people and so on and so forth. So, so there are a number of these factors actually. So, and a clear gap was uh, at the time in 2018, at least uh, between the organized and uh, rather informal uh, civil society, at least in, in the Czech context. Another one uh, of the questions was related to basically uh, this pro-democracy movements and pro democratization of some of the Central European countries. And I'm a big proponent of that. I think we, uh, at least from the Czech case, we can do, be doing that very effectively. Uh, the, the Czech transition uh, program uh, run by the Czech MFA is, has, uh, has uh, actually a long history of, uh, I would say, some fundamental successes in the neighborhood, uh, especially in uh, the Eastern part of Europe, but also Western Balkans and elsewhere. Um, I think this is, uh, very good to continue but obviously for the civil society this is a challenge and this was again once again what uh, came out of the research that uh, some of the 
well-established organizations, and among them, uh, Natalia is well aware of, uh, you know, People in Need, obviously, uh, an organization that uh, is one of the biggest ones uh, in, the, in the region, actually, and operating across the world, basically. But uh, when speaking uh, with, with some of the representatives, I understood that uh, the organization itself, you know, over the last two, three years, actually, had to um, rethink its engagement in the world and really focus and, and somehow return back home in terms of its engagement. You know, it has always invested a lot in, in the Czech Republic, and it can't be excuse of uh, accused of not doing that. But uh, still, still, uh, this perception of this um, pressure after the 2017 uh, parliament elections, you know, increasing, uh, you know, um, uh, this defamation campaigns against the civil society and so on, they had to take on board. So, so this was something to reflect on from uh, the Czech civil society, especially the the ones having very strong internet national connections uh, in here. So, 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 so on that, uh, uh, one thing that we didn't really touch upon, and I think it would be a mistake not to do that, is uh, when, it, when to speak about transformation of the civil society is obviously the COVID-19 pandemic. We didn't, I think we avoided the, the word, you know, we, we somehow tried to escape, but uh, it's obviously impossible. And that's why we are speaking online and not in, in physical meeting. Uh, and this is actually pushing the civil society very, very hard to, to transform, you know, both in terms of uh, digital skills, in terms of uh, adjusting to the new methods of communication with policymakers to deal with uh, granting schemes to deal with their own constituencies you know when it comes to obviously uh, both youth organization but also uh, a, a, a socially oriented uh, civil society and so on and so forth so so all of these all of these are now having this huge uh, challenge posed by the pandemic and they are pushed to transform and i think that this might be really an opportunity and i'm a life optimist uh, by nature so i'm i'm always trying to see that opportunities and and in here and i think what, what is and it, it has been proven by the public polling you know at least in the Czech republic and probably the figures for the other countries are showing similar numbers uh, it is the case that civil society being pushed under these conditions to really do something about this, you know, because at the beginning, the state was not capable of providing the personal uh, protective equipment and so on and so forth. So, so civil society was there, you know, informal and formal as well, you know, and they were very much engaged, you know, and this is, this is exactly the means and the, the, the kind of opportunity that maybe also the civil society needed for really establishing, re-establishing these connections with their constituencies, with the citizens, for, for everybody in, in the country to understand that the civil Civil society is something good, you know, that we, we need civil society, we need organized citizens, you know, to, to, to be engaged, but also to really overcome these huge challenges that we are now facing. So, so I see that as a big opportunity. And uh, I think this, this might be and this is obviously, once again, both for the EU and the, the Eastern neighborhood. Um, uh, uh, the same situation. One last point, and I promise to respond to the question on, on Belarus uh, and, and obviously how the Belarusian civil society uh, is, is now responding. And, and here I would like to once again share a best case of best practice actually from Belarus, you know, when the EU was uh, for years actually, since uh, 2016, um, providing this um, and facilitating the uh, engagement and, and interaction between the state and civil society. When, uh, when uh, the EU pushed that, you know, obviously it was part of the uh, conditionality uh, mechanism, you know, from the side of the European Union to, for example, uh, give uh, Lukashenko regime some funding for transformation uh, economically and so on. But uh, one of the conditions was that they will speak and not uh, uh, criminalize uh, the civil society in Belarus. And I think what, once the context is obviously so much different, you know, in, in the East than in the EU itself, the uh, EU should be much more actually present in the dialogue between uh, the civil society and the state structures as well. So, so this uh, on a, on a Belarusian uh, question as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pablo. We have a very pragmatic question from Johannes Adefeld, and I would like to first pass over to you, uh, Marty. Uh, apart from financing, what sort of external assistance or collaborations do civil society organizations in Central and Eastern Europe need the most to enhance their resilience or uh, or uh, increase their operational efficiency? Well, there's a quite a lot <laughs> that can be done. Um, uh, Natalia's paper also talks about this. I also mentioned this in my remarks, you know, the transnational networking 
which is has of course a solidarity aspect you know um, if uh, if uh, the Bulgarian Helsinki committee is facing um, the threat of, of um, a, a motion to deregister it because of the good um, uh, work that it's doing on behalf of the most vulnerable people in Bulgaria, then we should all be aware and make sure that this is, this is um, a known threat and that this is, you know, um, not confined to the Bulgarian space because this affects our space too in Hungary or in, or, in, or in Denmark or in, the, in Spain too. So I think this is one aspect, but the other is the transfer of knowledge and expertise. There's quite a lot already built up. So why not you know, have more space to share this and also resources. I think there could be a lot done. Um, COVID has uh, shown us a lot of things. Uh, we are here in a webinar and it seems pretty natural. Um, we could also share lots of other resources and I think that would be um, something to, to look into on the long term. But one is always occupied with the present day priorities of, of political and other nuisances. And on this, I think there's also quite a lot that can be done, facilitated also beyond civil society networks. I think what is really interesting is that um, if we look at this as a over maybe a 10 year period when it comes to Hungary, how um, despite all the, the absolutely justified criticism about the slowness or the inadequacy of response by European institutions, certainly we see how um, certain um, worrying phenomena are much faster responded to when things started going badly. And this is an absolutely um, simplifying term that I'm using in Poland. I think the European public space and the institutions were much quicker to respond, partly because Hungary has sadly put that out on, on, on the horizon. Um, and so this, this kind of response needs to be um, boosted. And it's not only the European institutions in Brussels that need to take action, first become aware and then take action, but I think there's a lot to be done in capitals. Civil society organizations have a huge role in this, and I think it's extremely useful to also look at the solidarity in this respect. It's not only in terms of calling out um, bad practices, harmful measures, but also in, in mobilizing locally it would be great if, um, and this is just a, a hypothetical example, but it would be great if, you know, German organizations, for example, that are concerned with, um, with uh, racism in Germany would also ha could have the, the resources, the, the knowledge, the, the commitment to, to keep an eye out on what is happening to the same kind of target groups in, um, in Bulgaria. And if they would also raise this with the German presidency, for example, when Germany holds the, the, the EU presidency, this kind of, of um, solidarity, which is both horizontal and also in this sense, if we call this vertical, um, this would be extremely useful. And I think there's a lot to, to work on on that and also not only through civil society but finally if businesses would come on board and and and, and visibly come on board um, when it, when um, it comes to rule of law part of which um, spectrum is of course civil society space and the other free media extremely important and we should also always mention that i think that would be a big step forward things would not be where they are now if 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 big, uh, large, you know, very large co corporations would have spoken up um, publicly and also behind closed doors about these issues. So I think maybe that's the biggest challenge, but it would make a, a big difference. Thank you, Mati. Natalia, would you like to jump in? Yeah, well, I think um, also when we are talking about what can be done is, um, I'm actually pretty certain that money is not an answer per se. 
uh, because uh, because well we, we we have an example of of a neighboring country, big country like Ukraine, where the the amounts of uh, of support of uh, civil society are quite significant, and they are like as as uh, Pavel already mentioned, like at times bigger than what Central Europe receives. But we see that the problem facing there by civil societies are well uh, similar. Um, so and and what I was also thinking about is that we have not we, we shouldn't really fall into trap of kind of talking about civil society as an object because it's not only about what donor or the government should or shouldn't do it's first of all what about uh, what, what the groups can do themselves because it's actually about their societies and, and their work because i mean it, ha it has been um long discussed in the in the public policy circles problem of uh, of this kind of false dependency between between the donor setting agenda and, and civil society and i think that actually currently with all these grassroots movements with with um, technology which enabled kind of the, the communication and and engagement with uh, with people on much easier models we are at the moment when it's actually possible to kind of move from this scheme and and change the power relationship and it's it's certainly a very difficult process because as i also mentioned in in the paper we have we have a past dependency we have we, we know all the methodologies of of how how working uh, to work with donors but it's quite difficult to to start uh, marketing marketing yourself to to find the new and and correct words to, to explain yourself to, to broader population and make people believe in you. But uh, I think that unfortunately that uh, that would be the best way forward because uh, um, yeah, because 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 we need this transformation just to make not just civil society as an uh, element of democracy, but democracy itself to to become sustainable in those countries. And and when we come back to the so and and then it means it means networking, it means knowledge transfer and, and knowledge sharing between uh, between our various actors. It means yeah, m mainly I I should think and uh, but. That that's uh, that can be enabled. So I, I would say that like donors or, or or democratic governments can can play here supportive role, but still the the driving seat and the driver is civil society itself. Thank you, Natalia. We have approximately five minutes for a last round of questions, and and if you allow me, I would just bunch together uh, two questions which are directly linked to the to the policy paper. The, the first one is uh, from Jörg Forbrig, and the question is, uh, where can you a delicate balance be found between professionalization and, and strong links to the society, bearing in mind that, that more or less professionalization could also somehow contribute to the, to the former disconnectedness between, between NGOs and, uh, and the society? And the last one would be, would be my question that I, I I'm really convinced from your rec recommendations and completely agree with you that constituency building is really the, the alpha and the omega of, uh, of uh, civil society uh, capacity building. But whether really watchdog NGOs who, for example, work with disenfranchised and vulnerable groups, and which are also very often the clear targets of uh, uh, of uh, government harassment, whether they are not systemically disadvantaged when, when it comes to the question how, for example, they can enhance or broaden their constituency and pull in new resources to the operation of, uh, of their organizations, and whether you have any recommendations specifically for those group of, of institutions who really work with social groups who itself are in lack of social and uh, and other resources. So thank you so much, Nati, and over to you. Thank you. Well, I, I will start from, from your question, Danny, uh, because yes, you're totally right. I mean, it is more difficult for them and, and it's quite obvious. Um, and we can even see, because I mean, 
uh, we can even see in the history like what happened with this idea of one percent tax which should have been an option for for the broader groups of society a policy solution for them to to donate and to support and if we look at at how this one percent is spent then in in totally everywhere in the region we will see that the like most of it goes into charity initiatives supporting like um, ill children or their education or something like that so that's basically like classic charities themselves um, and it is it is very hard to to reverse this trend however um, like uh, for example our colleagues in in Poland are trying to go around it so what they have their response to this situation has been to create um, the what, what they call the civic fund so basically they attracted the people with remarkable um, a reputation in the society like first ombudsman uh, and uh, people who were launching the, the operations of constitutional court and they formed the board of this foundation so basically the foundation is hunting for this one percent and they jointly and thanks to this reputation they have been able to attract much more funds than they used to do previously as individual human rights initiatives and then this foundation distributes it uh, among the very like unpopular uh, difficult uh, human rights topics and that's that's one of the way around so um i mean that that would be um and that wouldn't make sense to deny that it's more difficult but uh, it means that the more creativity is needed and uh, obviously it, it, returning to the rule of law question we should all understand that of course uh, it is the right answer when the state to certain extent supports this kind of activities because in the democracy the human rights work is very necessary uh, but uh, that's like ideally i think that should be a combination of, of several sources and uh, it doesn't cancel the fact that working with the society at large is not just uh, necessary but also possible um going back to our favorite professionalization um I don't know. I mean, maybe there is no answer, like uh, uh, no one model which fits all, because uh, I think like any any organization needs experts. Uh, but then it doesn't mean that these experts should be like living in the vacuum and uh, not reaching out to, to, to the society. It also doesn't mean that grassroots initiatives are in some uh, understanding worse or less valuable i think there should be a combination of different models in the society and uh, and then we we will have a healthy situation when there are both people who are just campaigning for something and and people who are experts in their um, like maybe even narrow sphere thank you so much as we are approaching the end of our webinar i would like to say a big thank you for all natalia marta and pavel for your interviewing insights Ladies and gentlemen, many thanks for being with us today. Exactly in two weeks, on October 28, we will discuss the perspectives of post-corona recovery in Central and Eastern Europe. Meanwhile, I would like also to call your attention on the OPET series we are going to launch next week. In regular daily contributions, we will cover the perspectives of individual Central and Eastern European countries on the US presidential contest and the country's expectations towards the new administration. Stay tuned, have a nice evening, and see you next time. Goodbye.